So good afternoon, everyone. Um, and I have great pleasure in welcoming Dr. Ajay Chibber to deliver a distinguished public lecture. You know, we have a convention in the university that some lectures are prefixed with the adjective, ad adjectives, distinguished and public. Um, and, and this, by convention, this lecture is always presided by the vice chancellor. So we do different lectures in the different schools of um, the General Global University. But this is a special series. And this lecture is even more special because it's the first of the distinguished public lectures since we were able to reassemble um, on campus after the interregnum of um, COVID. So it's a very special um, feature to the lecture. And I'm absolutely delighted that um, Dr. Ajay Chibas agreed to uh, deliver this lecture um, today. Um, he um, was my boss in UNDP. He was the head of the Regional Bureau for Asia, but also the associate administrator of UNDP. Now, UNDP is one of those organizations that calls its head administrator. That has something to do with the Marshall Plan, where the Marshall Plan had an administrator. And so that title remains. So he was associate administrator in UNDP. But before that, he had a very distinguished career in the World Bank. And, and some of you may know, since many of you are public policy students, that um, you know, we went through phases about worrying about the state, uh, too much state, too little state, and so on. And he did a landmark uh, report of the World Development Report of um, the World Bank in 1997, which in a way brought the state back in, you know, and um, as to the neoliberal view that the state is a nuisance and, and should be kept out of, uh, except very, very minimal government. Um, so the change in um, the outlook towards the state began with that very influential um, report for which uh, Dr. Chibba was the lead author. Um, I just learned that um, he's from um, uh, Haryana and um, lived, you know, is, uh, knows, grew up in Hisar and in other parts of Haryana. He's a hockey champion and, and that's why he was an all-rounder at St. Stephen's, apart from just academic brilliance, um, a sportsman. Um, and so uh, we are very, very fortunate that um, he took time off to come all the way to Delhi to um, deliver this lecture on making India a prosperous and happy nation when it gets to be 100. That's 2047. Um, and I note the term happy because um, Dr. Chibba has got another uh, connection. Uh, I met him and spent time with him in Bhutan when um, the government in Bhutan organized a, a very big conference on democracy. And, um, and you know, Bhutan uh, is a country that prides itself in uh, dispensing with the gross domestic product and even dispensing with the human development index of UNDP and to have something called the gross happiness uh, index um, and working on you know elements of that which is important in an important advance because it brings into uh, play nature and environment in a significant way which the other two measures of development do not do um, so so I think it's something to look forward to, um, uh, a lecture on how uh, India might become a happy country. Um, you know, some people think that you must just become ascetic and, uh, you know, become complete vairagis and uh, you'll be happy, but that's not how normally human beings are. So there's more to happiness than just some state of mind or spirituality, as Professor Naresh Singh might think of it. Uh, so we look forward to that. But before that, I have great pleasure in uh, requesting our Vice Chancellor um, to address us uh, uh, and preside over this event this afternoon. Thank you.
A very good afternoon to all of you. Um, I suppose this is the first time since March 2020, all of us have uh, assembled in such large numbers uh, to, to have a distinguished public lecture. So it's not only a very special moment for the Jindal School of Government and Public Policy to host Dr. Ajay Chibber to deliver the distinguished public lecture, but also a very special moment for the university to be able to have all of you. For all the students of the Jindal School of Government and Public Policy, those who are pursuing the Masters in Public Policy, the Masters in Economics, uh, the Bachelors in Economics, and of course, those who also have enrolled in the Social Science and Policy degree, all of you, I want to first of all extend a warm welcome to you to return to the university for those who have been uh, in the campus before, but also for the first and second years who had enrolled in 2020 and 2021, to be able to come into the campus for the first time uh, since you enrolled. Um, I'm very, very delighted to have all of you here. Um, I want to also, first of all, mention that uh, Dr. Ajay Chibber is a very distinguished economist and somebody who has made significant contributions to public policy at the international level and also made contributions within India. Uh, a very distinguished scholar, researcher, public policy specialist, and somebody who has uh, made immense uh, contribution to research in the field, and we'll, we'll briefly introduce him. But what is also equally special is that uh, he's from the state of Haryana. He is kind of a son of the soil, as we say, and he grew up in uh, Hisar, which is not very far from here, which is where uh, our Chancellor's family and the Jindal family general is from. So I'm very, very delighted uh, to have him um, be part of this conversation. Um, he's going to speak on a theme. Uh, entitled Making India a Prosperous and Happy Nation at 100. As we know, we've just celebrated our, or rather celebrating our 75th year of independence, and it's an opportune time for us to think about the future. And uh, many a time when we think about the immediate, not less than 35, not all, all of you students are less than 35. So when most parts of the Western world will become older, and Eastern world, including China and Japan, will become older. India will be younger and will be younger for a longer time. Uh, Indian life expectancy at the dawn of independence was approximately 35 and now we have moved over 70. That means the extraordinary opportunity that is before us to shape the future of India, but also in that process shaping the future of the world is going to be done by the young people of the Jindal School of Government and Public Policy, along with many others across the country and around the world. And that is why it's important for us to appreciate this opportunity for being educated and in that process making contribution to our own society. And lastly, I want to say that for all the students who are here, um, you know, if there is one thing that the pandemic has taught all of us is that we can't take these moments for granted. Um, it's such a, it was a very difficult time, not only because of the fact that lives were lost, but we simply could not meet and interact with each other. We simply could not experience life as we had always known. But that's not alone the problem. Online education in all its forms and manifestations could not do justice to what we always wanted to. But even there, the tragedy is a lot of people around the world simply could not get access. UNESCO has estimated that 1.5 billion people around the world were removed out of education during the pandemic because they simply had no access whatsoever for online education. All of us, including all our students, are to a large extent significantly privileged that you had access to online education. Even in a country like India, where most educational institutions at the higher education level were attempting to offer online education, the reality is only, and this is another data point which worries me a lot, only 15% of Indian households have three things which are essential for online education. A reasonable access to electricity, a reasonable access to Wi-Fi, and a reasonably working equipment, all three of which are essential for online education. So, with this privilege, 
that all of us have got. To be here at this moment, let's make the best use of it. These few months that you have in the, for this semester and hopefully when you return back in August too. I am conscious of the fact that as we celebrate this moment, China, including parts of East Asia, is seeing a rise of COVID. We are also seeing a significant rise of COVID cases in Europe too. I can only hope that these were still aberrations and we will be able to overcome and the situation in India and parts of South Asia doesn't change uh, for worse and we can continue living the life that we are experiencing at this moment. So with those words, I want to formally introduce Dr. Ajay Chibar, a distinguished visiting scholar at the Institute of International Economic Policy at the Elliott School of International Affairs, George Washington University. Dr. Chibber is a distinguished visiting scholar at the Institute for International Economic Policy at George Washington University and non-resident senior fellow at the Atlantic Council. He was the first Director General of the Independent Evaluation Office in India at the level of the Minister of State and a distinguished visiting professor at the prestigious National Institute of Public Finance and Policy. He served as Assistant Director, Assistant Secretary General at the United Nations and Assistant Administrator at the United Nations Development Program, where he was responsible for work on Asia and the Pacific. At the World Bank, he served in senior positions as Country Director in Turkey and Vietnam and Director of the 1997 World Development Report on the Role of the State. He has a PhD from Stanford University, an MA from the Delhi School of Economics, and won the David Rajaram Prize for Best All-Rounder at the St. Stephen's College, University of Delhi, where he received B honors in economics. He's also done advanced management courses at Harvard University and at INSEAD France. His latest book, co-authored with Salman Sos, is entitled Unshackling India, Hard Truths and Clear Choices for Economic Revival, which has been just published by HarperCollins. With those words, let me have the privilege of inviting Dr. Ajay Chibber to deliver the distinguished public lecture on the theme, Making India a Prosperous and Happy Nation at 100. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Vice Chancellor Raj Kumar, and thank you, uh, Dean Sudarshan. Uh, it's uh, so kind of you to invite me. As you've already said, I, have, I am a son of the soil here, and uh, the Vice Chancellor just gave me a beautiful book which shows the links to this area, to the Harappan civilization, which I didn't know about even having grown up here. So I'm, I'm really honored to be here uh, in this great university that you are establishing um, in, in Haryana. Whenever I land in India, you know, you get this tingling in your skin that I've arrived home. And today, just as I was crossing the border from Delhi to Haryana, I asked the driver, tell me when we're crossing the border. And as soon as we crossed the border, I got that extra tingle also which comes from being from uh, Haryana as well. So thank you so much. And I must uh, say that such a great institution is being built on this uh, historical land with so much history behind it under your leadership, Vice Chancellor Dr. Raj Kumar. So I salute you. The venerable industrialist Jamshedji Tata, the old man, not the one who's running Tata's now, uh, said, I don't want India to be an economic superpower. I want India to be a happy country. Unusual for a big industrialist to say that. But it cannot be happy unless it achieves a certain level of sustainable prosperity. And it cannot prosper unless its development is more inclusive 
and remo removes disparities in income, gender, caste, religion, and is sustainable. Both go together, happiness and prosperity. If India reaches an average yearly per capita income level of, say, 12,500, which is by 2047, considered to be the cutoff to move from middle income status, which is where India now is, to a high income status country, roughly where Mauritius and Romania are today, with a projected population of 1.6 billion, India will be a $20 trillion economy, an economic superpower. Even if it achieves a level of income of $10,000, roughly where Mexico or Argentina are today, India will be a $16 trillion economy, the third largest in the world. But by no means will it be a happy country if it has their level of income inequality um, and most likely, just like them, will be stuck in what we call a middle income trap. The point is, given its size, India is likely to be the world's third largest economy by any means by 2047. But whether it will be a happy country, more inclusive, less unequal, or go by the way of what Latin America today is, remains to be seen. By the way, India ranked just this week, the Global Happiness Index rankings came out. There's something called a Global Happiness Index. And India ranked 132nd on that index. So we're certainly not a happy country by that index. It's not a great index, but whatever, that's the index we have. So India needs to be reshaped to become not just a more prosperous, but also a happier nation, a nation that takes its rightful place in the world, but is also a beacon to others in becoming a more inclusive, democratic, sustainable society, which provides a better life for its girls and marginalized communities, a genuinely secular and caring society with a state that belongs to the people and not an overbearing state that stifles innovation ingenuity and initiative. An economy of, for that matter, the broader society is a mix of moving parts. When they grind together at the right gear, the economy can move ahead. And if all are on board, society can prosper in an inclusive manner. If not, social strife sets in and does further damage to the economy. Think of an economy like a bus. If the bus's gearbox is impaired, the best that is achievable is maybe second gear. To get it to move faster at fourth or fifth gear, the gearbox has to be fixed. If the bus is overloaded, then too it cannot move fast. If different parts don't work, the exhaust system or the steering wheel, then the bus moves in fits and starts or wears off in the wrong direction. And if the lights are not working, the bus can only be used during daylight. If any of the parts malfunction, the bus becomes not travel worthy. It's the same for the economy. If some parts are not working, the country slows down. If you neglect health and education, you cannot move up the development ladder. If you neglect infrastructure, you cannot compete. If you neglect its defenses, it can be taken over, as we have many times in the past. If you neglect its finances, it will be unable to deliver the credit without which no modern economy can thrive. So the many parts must move together to make the economy function at top gear. So what are the key reforms that are needed looking forward? I lay out here six broad areas where change is needed and suggest solutions, not just diagnosis of the problems. First, reduce the scope and reach of the state, the government, and strengthen its cap capabilities. India needs a new social contract between the state and citizens. The Modi government has a slogan, maximum governance, minimum government, which has not yet been 
seriously addressed. India needs to be unshackled from an overbearing state, trying to do too much and doing much of it, in my opinion, badly. India must focus much more on basic education, primary health care, as well as on irrigation, drinking water and sanitation and national defense. These are vital state functions which do not have at the moment adequate resources devoted to them. You would be surprised to know that if we removed the pension part of defense spending, we have the lowest defense spending as a share of GDP in the last 50 years of our history. Another important, so these are vital state functions. Another important state function is research and development that has huge benefits not only to society, but also to private businesses who typically will underinvest in research and development as there are innovation benefits that they cannot capture entirely. There are also huge benefits to collective action on climate finance since the market will not deliver these as well. In most other areas, the state's role should be regulator, not provider. Roads, railway lines, electricity transmission can also be for now considered state functions, but could be corporatized with state companies rather than departments run on commercial principles. Power distribution, generation, airports, ports, air travel, telecom, tertiary education, Tertiary healthcare could all be areas where the state sells its public sector companies and becomes a regulator. In that sense, the sale of Air India back to the Tatas was a very important signal. But how privatization is done will also matter. Selling to cronies and oligarchs, as was the case in Latin America or Russia, will not work well either. So reducing the scope of the state is, uh, is one part of the strategy to make the state more effective. The other part is improving its capability to do what it, what it does better. We cannot run a 21st century economy with a 19th century state apparatus. Now one part of this is administrative reform. India has too few teachers, doctors, judges, police personnel even, and, and even foreign service officers. And it appears to have too many clerical and support staff. But India's government is also very expensive because the lower 90% of government staff are overpaid relative to the private sector, a tendency which has been pushed by various pay commissions, especially the last one. But we can do further. Instead of hiring these people at the central level, it would be much better to hire them at the state, at the provincial, the state level, or better yet, at the local government level, where salaries are much lower. India flouts every principle of subsidiarity that the location of a service should be at the lowest level possible in the government system. In China, which is a totalitarian, authoritarian state, almost 50% of government spending is at the local level, not at the central level, not at the state level, at the local level, compared to less than 4% in India. The central government on recommendations of successive finance commissions has shifted more and more resources to the state, this is the provincial level, but there is very little further devolution to the local level, giving much, a local government much greater authority to raise revenues through property taxes and user fees is also necessary. India has one of the lowest property tax uh, rates in the world. Some argue that their capacity to deliver services and manage funds is weak, but this excuse has gone on long enough. India also needs to overhaul its social assistance system from what I call product-based subsidies to people, 
focused subsidies. Direct benefit transfers are a better way than a slew of subsidies on food and fertilizer and electricity and many other items I could name, which cause huge market distortions and breed corruption. Corruption still remains a huge pain in India. There are claims that corruption has improved recently in India based on the perceptions of business people. But if citizens are surveyed, India emerges, still emerges as the most corrupt country in Asia. And there's no quick fix here like demonetization. A multi-pronged approach will be needed, including much greater transparency, greater competition, more IT-based services, harsher penalties, and a reform of the police and the judiciary. Electoral bonds give the facade of less corruption, but it just hides huge political corruption. Second of the six areas I mentioned, much greater focus on learning, skilling, and health outcomes, including nutrition. The foundation of India's development and education and health remain weak. Education has expanded, including for girls, but repeated ASAR surveys, do you know ASAR, ASAR the annual survey of education results done by Pratham? There are huge learning gaps in India. In the 21st century, with huge technological advances already underway, from AI to space exploration to biotechnology, India will fall behind unless it fixes its yawning learning gap. India pulled out of the PISA rankings because it scored so poorly. Running away from the problem will not solve the issue. Confronting it squarely will be needed. Pratham, which does the surveys, thinks the solution lies in fixing public schools. And, you know, in Delhi, people claim that the AAP party has actually succeeded in doing some of that and may explain why they have won an election in Punjab. Others have different opinions on this. It's, others think the government should fund education but allow civil society to run the schools. What everyone seems to agree on is that learning problems are being caused by unprepared learners, ineffective teaching, inputs that don't reach the classroom, and terrible governance. One important factor often missed is that cognitive abilities are most affected by early childhood nutrition and education. The governance issues in education mirror what we see more broadly in the public sector. Too much centralized spending with the central government providing top-down funding and a set model often unsuited to local conditions. Too high salary scales that make public ed school education more expensive than private schools with lower learning outcomes. The new national education policy of 2020 tries to address some of these by focusing on early childhood education, learning outcomes, and more fundings, but it does not adequately address the top-down structure and the resultant governance problems and may end up remaining a vision. In solution, allowing much greater experimentation at the state and local levels must be the way forward to find out what works best and why. India must also build up world-class universities and research centers, must allow greater freedom and involvement of the private sector and build and run these freely, while using public funds to support, not supplant them. In line with the NEP's push for higher GER's gross enrollment ratios in the tertiary education, India must also learn from others. China, for example, has done very impressive uh, improvements in its tertiary education. India has seen improvements in child and maternal mortality, but the latest health surveys show that stunting is increasing. Stunting is increasing, let me repeat that. Despite all the improvements in overall income and food production. This is a shocking trend and suggests that health outcomes are dependent on not just what we do on health, but on a host of factors that determine health outcomes. Health outcomes are not just determined by what happens in the health sector. Poor maternal nutrition is a key factor causing low birth weight, which then leads to stunting. Maternal nutrition is in turn dependent on mother's education, gender disparities in food intake, 
and more broadly income inequalities. Then water quality, sanitation, air quality matters uh, as well. So uh, India, of course, now is uh, using uh, DBT schemes to ensure children are fed better and using the Anganwadis to supplement diet in the first years. Uh, this may have uh, good payoffs if it is done well. India also greatly underspends on health and despite the pandemic continues to underspend on health. Spending overall is only 3.5% of GDP of which public spending is only 1.3% of GDP. Out of pocket uh, payments spending, out-of-pocket expenses remain very high at 63% of the total spend on, on health. The government hopes to increase public spending to 2.5% of G GDP, uh, but I think it should go even higher to at least 3 and with a 6% overall spend. As with all other sectors, a top-down approach plagues the health sector. Um, and uh, I won't go into more detail here. Let me skip some of this, but I can talk more in the Q&A if you want. The third big area that strikes you when you study India compared to any other country in the world is how uh, the treatment of women. Uh, so third, I'd say end women's exploitation, economic, legal, political, and gender violence. While women have made progress on health and education indicators, their economic contribution to India's development remains hugely unfulfilled. The declining sex ratio of 918 in the 2021 census. Female infanticide has been on the rise in India, especially in the so-called heartland states of Haryana, Punjab, Uttar Pradesh, Bihar, Madhya Pradesh, Rajasthan, and Gujarat shows that the value parents attach to girls has been declining. Now, since 2015, the government has launched the Beti Bachao Beti Padao program, but only the next census will really tell us if, we, if it has made uh, any great impact. The maternal mortality ratio, that is how many women die at childbirth, has declined but remains still very high at around 130. Um, the female labor force participation rate, which was already one of the lowest in the world, has declined further to around 0.20. And this is largely in the rural areas as women find no suitable paid employment. And unlike other countries such as Bangladesh, right next door to us, where girls with secondary education find jobs in the garment industry, Apparently, no such options exist in India. And Bangladesh's female labor force participation ratio has been rising uh, at a very high rate. According to Bina Agarwal's work, women's ownership of assets also remains very low, averaging 14% of landowners and 11% of the land. And despite the Succession Act, which gives girls equal rights to family assets, Widows are more likely to inherit land than daughters because then the land stays within the family. Gender violence is also a major issue in India beyond infanticide. There have been improvement in some laws, but uh, you know, it's still a very dismal uh, situation. Political power for women is also very unequal, and the law providing one-quarter reservations to seats in parliament for women has languished for over a decade. I remember coming here when I was in UNDP with the then administrator, the former Prime Minister of New Zealand, Helen Clark, waiting to see Prime Minister Manmohan Singh because the debate was still going on in Parliament and that law never passed. And this was, I think, in, nine, in 2010, uh, sometime like that. Anyway, the fourth area I want to emphasize is to re-engineer the economy for more inclusive growth and create more jobs. While the world has changed, India's farm policy is stuck in a 20, in a 50 year mindset. India's response to food shortages in the 60s was to establish a mix of policies that led to uh, the Green Revolution. But that system has outlived its usefulness. And there is no alternative mechanism offered to the farmers. 
leading to what you all saw, huge farm protests. I'm sure Sonipat was probably at the center of all that turbulence during the uh, protest. So what India needs, uh, I'm going to skip a little bit of this to in interest of time, but what India needs, in my view, is a second green revolution, but one which is, allows farmers much greater choice in what they are producing. At the moment, with the MSP system, with you know, free electricity, with the way the whole setup is there on fertilizer subsidies, etc., they are being forced to grow more and more of wheat, especially in this area, wheat, rice, and sugar cane. And we are, our stocks of wheat and rice are four times what we need at this point. Uh, now, the solutions to India's uh, agriculture problems lie only partly in the farm sector. It also depends on what happens in manufacturing and services. Unlike in East Asia, India did well in the service sector, but failed to create the low-skill manufacturing that pulled millions out of poverty in China, South Korea, Malaysia, Thailand, Vietnam, and now increasingly in Bangladesh. As a result, in India, the share of agricultural output has declined to below 15%. But still, over 42% of the workforce is still dependent on agriculture. The average farm size is now about one hectare. And 86% of farms are under two hectares. So we need a second green revolution, uh, which I, I can talk a lot more about, but I think I'll skip on it unless you want me to get into in the Q's and A's. India's structural transformation has missed the bus on industrialization. India has, in fact, been what Danny Roderick calls prematurely deindustrializing. Um, and the share of uh, in, uh, industry has stagnated and in recent years has even declined. An inverted duty structure where tariffs on intermediate products in some cases remain higher than on final products made India's industry even less competitive. And free trade agreements were pursued aggressively, with India agreeing to concessions in industry with ASEAN in the hope that in the second stage, the FTBA would be expanded to services, which never materialized. In 2015, the Modi government announced a new Make in India. You've all heard of Make in India initiative to try and reverse the industrialization. But it remained just an announcement, and between 2009 and, 2000, uh, 20, uh, 2009 and 2019, over a 10-year period, industry share in GDP fell from over 31% to around 25% today. India has focused on improving its rank on the World Bank's Ease of Doing Business Index, where it has improved its rank from 142 to 63rd in 2019. But the costs of doing business have remained, still remained very high. And Indian industry has not been able to compete with China and ASEAN on a range of products. In 2018, the government changed course and began to increase tariffs uh, to protect industry. And by 2019, the weighted average tariff rate was above 10%. It had fallen to around 4 5%, then it's gone up again. But this reversal risks going back to the old protectionist model for India, which did not serve it well. Swami Vivekananda said it best in 1850, we enter the world like a gymnasium to make ourselves strong. We must learn from our cricket team, both men and women cricket teams. We used to win only at home. But we persevered, and we are now world beaters on any pitch anywhere in the world. We must adopt the same strategy for our trade and industrial policy. To attract industry, especially firms leaving China, India has now announced a new PLI scheme. The scheme envisages new investments leading to higher production uh, would get cash incentives of about 4 to 6%. Picking winners with expensive subsidies alone may not work unless the reasons behind India's lack of competitiveness are also addressed 
while we give these firms a five-year period of uh, incentives to be able to uh, improve themselves. In contrast to its poor showing in industry, India was hugely uh, successful in services, especially IT services, healthcare, and now increasingly e-commerce, and perhaps e-education e also. This was because unlike in industry, the cost of doing business, which came from poor infrastructure and weak education and health systems were not so debilitating. In fact, India had sufficient well-trained English speaking IT engineers to give it a competitive advantage in grabbing the outsourcing of chunks of business out of developed high wage countries to low wage India. India became the back office for many services. Nevertheless, India remains a back office and has not yet been able to become a formidable leader in IT because it spends very little on R&D. On the other hand, while services have provided jobs to thousands of IT engineers and have spawned and supporting ecosystem, they are not able, I emphasize, they are not able to provide mass employment to lower skilled workers with secondary education which lifted millions out of poverty in East Asia. Tourism, and you, now that we know that we are linked to the Harappan civilization, we can push it more, remains another low-hanging fruit that India has not yet exploited to employ its underemployed, despite its vast coastline, huge historical and religious heritage, and varied geography. India gets fewer foreign tourists than the islands of Hawaii or Macau. Think about it. India needs a concerted effort post COVID-19 to rectify this gap as tourism and related mobility services generate huge employment for relatively low skilled workers. India's exports grew rapidly after the first wave of liberalization and India's trade GDP ratio grew hugely. But India remains a very small player in international trade with exports forming only 2% two, two of global exports. Some feel India has missed the bus on export-led growth, but I don't believe that. India's shares in many major markets are so low that even if global trade slows down due to the pandemic and due to this uh, Russian-Ukrainian war, India could capture a much larger market share if it made a concerted effort. Um, and I can talk more about that concerted effort maybe in the Q&A. Fifth, pursue next generation reforms for realizing the demographic dividend that uh, Vice Chancellor Raj Kumar talked about, you know, the young population. India has over 40 different laws which apply to various sizes of firms. Even the former Prime Minister Atal Bihari Bajpai once said, India's labor laws are actually anti-worker. <laughs> what, what that has done is to push firms to hire more daily wage workers called casual labor. India has the world's largest share of casual labor in the world. Most of India's firms are below 10 workers, as the myriad of labor legislation does not apply below that level. India does not have a missing middle problem that some talk about, but a small firm size problem. India is now reforming its labor laws and put two thirds of them into four codes. But quite frankly, um, and we can debate this if you want, and I can talk a lot more about it, uh, it's all, a lot of it is in my book. I don't, I'm not sure that uh, we have, uh, you know, bell the, bell the cat at, at, with these changes that we are making. Some believe that India's land market is even more distorted than labor and that it has more significant effects on productivity because land is used as collateral to borrow capital. Land distortions then create capital market distortions, have negative effects on the overall productivity and competitiveness of the economy. Land grab and exploitation of poor landlord owners, especially in tribal areas by mining and energy companies, as well as badly managed labor displacement in public projects created a huge political problem. The new Land Act was passed 
which has certainly led to less exploitation, but it has also slowed down acquisition of land to such an extent that it has led to huge delays in public infrastructure projects, which have in turn meant a rise in non-performing assets in our banking systems. Some 11 states have now passed legislation to bypass this 2014 Land Acquisition Act. Um, I, I believe land lease has been tried in some cases and may be a better solution than actually trying to buy the land. It's amazing that with land so scarce, India has one of the lowest floor area ratios in the world. I don't know if you know what a floor area ratio is. It's the amount of floors you can build on a plot of land. And when you drive from here to Delhi, you can see spades of that, right? So much land, such sprawl in the way we... So we have the lowest floor area ratios in the world in a country which is so short of land. It's unbelievable. So it's a man-made problem. It has resulted in huge increases in costs of city transport and municipal infrastructure. Massive and unchecked migration has also meant that most cities have grown up in an unplanned manner with slums coming up in peri-urban areas uh, and then eventually getting formalized as their dwellers become vote banks for politicians, etc. India's neglected urban development India neglected urban development for a long time, and then a slew of top-down central schemes after 2000, lacking flexibility and without strong local government, have not really solved India's urbanization problem. Um, India's, uh, well, in, on infrastructure, let me say, India is gradually improving its infrastructure, but still much remains uh, to be done. Um, I, I also believe that uh, uh, river transport, the use of, you know, like you have river systems in Europe and in the United States, which are major sources of uh, development into the interior with huge river systems that we have like the Ganges and other rivers. We certainly should look more into that. Now here comes the shocker. <coughs> India's financial markets remain the most inefficient and the least inclusive in the world. Without a reform, it's like trying to run a marathon with a weak heart with clogged arteries. The surest way to a cardiac arrest, a financial crisis. <coughs> and I believe <coughs> what got us here is like an Agatha Christie who done it. How many of you have read Murder on the Orient Express or seen the movie? You know, where everyone gets the knife in. So here we have Murder on the Orient Express on the Indian financial system with bankers, politicians, crony capitalists, regulators, all equally to blame. The credit to GDP ratio, which is a measure of, you know, how much uh, results the system is giving us. The credit to GDP ratio for India is now around 50%. And it must be at least double of that. Most of our competitor countries in East Asia credit to GDP ratio is above 100% of GDP. So the system is not even giving credit, uh, enough credit. The intermediation cost, that's when you put, open a bank account, you get a um, return for you know, some interest you get on your account. The bank then lends money to others, and that difference it's called the intermediation cost. That intermediation cost for India is, um, is the highest in the world. It's five to six hundred basis points, five to six percent. That's the level that they have in places like Venezuela and Russia. In China, that ratio is 300 percent. Even in Bangladesh, it's 400 percent. In India, it's 600 percent. 
so major reform of the financial system is needed. I do believe a partial reprivatization of the banking system is badly needed. Uh, removing directed lending requirements from these banks um, and uh, focusing um, them much more on. And then for the smaller um, MSMEs, you know, different mechanisms, which I'm happy to talk about more, uh, should be given. Now, for the regulator, we think of the Reserve Bank of India as a great institution, which it probably is. But it's functioning not so well, partly not because of its own fault, but partly because of the structure in the way it's organized. It, it doesn't have full supervisory powers over the public sector banks. It should be given those. Its officials actually sit on the board of these banks. So how can you be a regulator when you're sitting on the board of the bank, right? So there's a, the Reserve Bank of India should not be the debt manager. It's also the debt manager of the government. But this conflicts in many ways because the debt manager means you want to get the lowest interest cost for the government. Whereas, and then you start interfering in the way the financial system is working in order to make that happen. Um, anyway, I can go on, on in detail, but you have it all in my book, so you can go and look at it there, but you get the point. The last sixth, we must prepare to leave behind a better country for our children, for you all, for the young generation like you, and your children, hopefully. India needs to focus less on its contentious history and its various divisive interpretations and focus much more on the future India we want to leave for our children and grandchildren. The COVID has shown us how unprepared we are for shocks because we have not built the resilience that is needed. The biggest threat looming ahead for India and the world is climate change. India's per capita emissions remain well below global averages. Um, but it could do a lot better. India could do a lot better. It could do much more if it improved its own energy efficiency of its GDP. India emits 0.3 kilograms of carbon dioxide for every dollar of GDP. About the same as Australia, Canada, and the US, three very highly energy intensive countries, and well above Europe, which is only 0.1 kilogram of GDP. Russia actually produces 0.5 kilograms for every GDP. But now India is the world's third largest emitter must become part of the solution. All that is changing now with India signing the Paris Agreement, helping establish the Global Solar Alliance, its commitment to become net zero by 2070, which the Prime Minister very rightly made recently at Glasgow. Now, in addition to the CO2, there's also, as you all breathe the air, you know, India is also creating huge amounts of local pollution, which leaves, which may not have global impact, but leaves air and water heavily polluted with huge costs to health, life expectancy, and productivity. India must not go China's way, a model described as pollute now and clean up later. Instead, jobs, infrastructure, and climate action must be viewed as a synergistic path for India. Green growth with jobs. <clears throat> with India, while India may be a victim of climate change, it can do a lot more to prepare and build its future in a more uh, resilient manner, over building cities, affecting natural flows, et cetera, et cetera. You know, we can talk more about it. With the world going through huge technological change, AI, and new ways of doing business, and more to come, some argue that it's difficult to predict change. That is true. The only thing we can predict for sure is that change is inevitable. Change in the way we will learn, in healthcare, in transport, travel, in the way we will work and live. Since it's hard to predict when and where the next biological IT or material technologies will come from, it is best we prepare our children for the ability to adopt to and thrive with change. Some fear new technologies will take away people's livelihoods, 
but such predictions were also made for previous technologies, such as the automobile, the telegraph, the mobile phone, and the railroad. It meant, in the end, it always meant higher and higher productivity on average. But yes, it did mean some benefited and some were left behind. So we need, therefore, to build a new area where we don't resist change, but ensure that all can participate. With India likely to be one-fifth of humanity by 2047, at our hundredth year of independence, we must build a base where India's youth contribute to innovation and technological change and are not just passive consumers of that change. If data is the new oil, with over 1.6 billion points of data, India will be the Saudi Arabia of the next phase of global development. Let me end by saying, will India make the change for the better? I am confident it will. But at what pace and for whom? In a muddled through, somewhat haphazard manner, India has of course made progress since the end of British rule, certainly far better than the previous hundred years of that colonization. Most villages have been electrified. Most of our children are going to primary school in villages and even in urban slums. Most people now use mobile phones. Road and highway construction, airports and ports have expanded to increase mobility across the country. Poverty, which had fallen by over 250 million, has risen again sharply due to COVID. But this reversal is hopefully temporary, as was the case during the global financial crisis. India's ranking in global GDP rose on the back of the 1991 reforms. Uh, GDP grew five times, and the middle class of about 300 million, many of whom you, many of you, your families are part of that. About 300 million emerged, about 25% of India's population. But so did inequality. The share of income going to the top 1% doubled in India from just over 10% in 1990 to 20% to in 2019. And the Gini coefficient, which is a measure of inequality, which was quite low in India at 0.32, has shot up in 20 years to 0.48, one of the highest in the world, probably only second now to Russia. And COVID-19 may have increased inequality even further. The Indian growth model had run out of steam even before the pandemic. GDP growth had slumped back in 2019, back to what my old professor Raj Krishna used to jokingly call the Hindu growth rate of 4%. Over 40, over 77 percent of the workforce, that is people who are actually working, have work with no benefits and no social security. And this was cruelly exposed during the pandemic when people were migrants flocked back. Its demographic dividend um, that uh, Vice Chancellor talked about is beginning to look like a demographic disaster. India has held together as a ramshackle, rambunctious democracy. But even that designation is under question by many inside and outside India, where elections are held, but people feel it's not a genuine democracy. So we must recognize that we are in a slow fuse crisis and must act. India's political class must broaden its goal and create a new economic and social vision instead of weakening institutions to serve narrow political goals and creating divisions in society to pit one group or religion against another. Unshackling India from its interventionist state, allowing young, aspirational India's innovativeness, flair and talent to be nurtured through better education and health systems and building the resilience with better preparedness for all these threats and with robust social assistance and insurance systems must be the way forward. India has, as you know, many inspiring individual stories, soldiers who fought bravely, sportswomen and men and women who persevered. We hear these stories, you know, every time somebody wins a medal. Despite all the adversity and, and entrepreneurs who built businesses, despite all the odds that I've talked about. But to become a developed country, India's institutions need bolstering so that collectively India can propel its individual genius and strength 
into countrywide progress and prosperity. The French Emperor Napoleon said it best, institutions, not armies, determine the destinies of nations. So I think the pandemic must wake up this country to make a resolute change for a metamorphosis. As the famous scientist Albert Einstein said, every crisis presents an opportunity. Uh, and what the trajectory India's economy will take post-pandemic will depend on our actions now. Even the Mahatma Gandhi said it very well. He said, the future depends on what we do now. So bending the arc of India's trajectory over the next 25 years, when India will celebrate 100 years of independence, will surely make India an economic power of the 21st century, but also a much happier country that all Indians deserve. Thank you. <clears throat>
the debt manager of the government has actually killed the bond market in India because it's not possible to really have a bond market with that kind of intervention going on by the RBI in the markets to keep interest rates low for the government, right? So, so, so there are a lot of things that people need to uh, sort of understand that way. And then, what has happened now is that we have. I mean, I'm not. I wasn't never a fan of the Planning Commission. In fact, I recommended its abolition. But we threw the baby out with the bathwater. We do need uh, somewhere in the government some way to think through how these things come together. And the Niti Aayog has not been given that mandate, as far as I can see, to do that. And we do need to bring back planning uh, in some way, especially now with climate change and with uh, the sustainable development goals. There's been a resurgence in planning in 140 countries have now gone back to planning. And India, at the same time, abandoned planning altogether. Has no uh, plan. No, there was supposed to be a vision, but nobody, nobody produced the vision. And all we had was this, uh, some sort of a strategy paper at 75, and nothing beyond that. So now all the allocations are being done uh, in the Ministry of Finance, I suppose, uh, or in individual ministries going to the prime minister's office and um, you know getting whatever they can get for whatever scheme so you have a lot of these sort of announcements you know skill india you know branding type of announcements make in india skill india startup india whatever you name it india you can have it but there is no overarching uh, framework in which all this as far as i can see is being done so one of the things we try to do in our book is to say, this is why you need this, some sort of an overarching framework. Uh, I have written a subsequent paper now called, Did We Throw the Baby Out with the Bath Water? And a relook at Niti Ayo. But uh, you, I think you got the point so well. Thank you. Uh, good evening, sir. Uh, thank you so much for this wonderful speech. It was truly enriching. Uh, so since you spoke about inclusivity, uh, my question is, do you think caste-based reservation has been uh, and will lead India to a prosperous future? Or has it presented itself uh, as, a, as an obstacle in the past? Actually, I wish my wife were here to answer your question because she's an expert on, uh, she's a professor of sociology and is an expert on these kinds of issues. But let me give you my... Um, sort of uh, simple answer that I, I do think affirmative action is necessary to bring people who have had um, centuries in our case of, uh, you know, um, being put down and insufficient opportunities. So I'm all, I'm all for um, affirmative action. Now, the way affirmative action has been now, has progressed in India, has been designed in India, has become politicized in India, I think a lot could be done to improve that. But I, 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 I don't want to come across as saying I'm against affirmative action. I do believe even after two, three uh, generations of affirmative action, still the dep uh, the the same opportunities that people who did not, families that did not go through that, don't face the same problems as people who did. But there's lots of problems in the way affirmative action has been politicized and mangled and um, vandalized or whatever you know the terminology is. Uh, I'm not an expert on it, but this is generally what I believe. So, Professor, uh, there are some online questions as well. Uh, fiscal, uh, sorry, we need to distinguish between political and administrative decentralization. Both are critical. India needs to work on both. Any comments? Yeah. yeah. So I, 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 I do think um, that, um, a, well, I mean, to, Say by 2047, you have a population of 1.6 billion people, right? 
in my book, I suggest that India should by then have at least 50 states. So we have about 29 now in these UTs. And that uh, states like UP, Bihar, Maharashtra, you can go on like that. Certainly, let's say I grew up in Haryana, right? Which was part of Greater Punjab. This part of Punjab and Himachal was also part of Greater Punjab, but completely languishing till Punjab was split into Haryana and then Himachal. And then Haryana took off. Haryana was a very backward area when it was part of Greater Punjab. So was Himachal, completely, except for Shimla, the town of Shimla, the rest of Himachal was in very bad shape. So, and now we see more and more of this taking place, like Uttarakhand from UP, uh, other split ups taking place. In general, I'm of the belief that a state which is going, a state of about 30 million is a manageable state. A state of 230 million is certainly not a manageable state. So shifting money from Delhi to Lucknow doesn't make any much difference. Uh, having said that, therefore, if we can get to, so if, if 30 million is roughly the size, and we are going to be 1.5, 1.6 billion, then roughly we should be at least um, 50 states. So now whether that will ever happen, I don't know, but that's what I believe. And that's what I push for. Now, but I don't think it's going to be enough because if you look at any developed country, you look at any OECD table, you look at China, the only way you can deliver, and in my book I have a very uh, great analogy used by a public administration specialist called Arturo Israel, who showed that when services have less specificity, like health and education, you know, it's very hard to determine what is causing certain outcomes and are also uh, enumerate, meaning there's a lot of those transactions, then those need to be devolved to the low, to very local levels of government for them to be effectively delivered. And that's what you see in most developed countries, right? Or education, health, everything is done at a very local level. There's an overarching framework. So that's where I believe that we should go. Now, your point on the political, so, so, uh, so on the uh, administrative side, you can think of devolution, and you can also think of giving states more, uh, local governments more opportunities to raise property taxes. But even if property taxes, uh, at the moment we are raising about 0.2% of GDP in property taxes. Even if we go to 1% of GDP, it's not going to be enough. And when you give more to the local level, there are more inequalities created because the richer parts of the country uh, will have more resources, obviously. So you'll have greater inequality. And we've seen that since 91, that not only has national individual inequality increased, but interstate inequality has also increased. And inter-district uh, uh, inter inequality also has increased to some extent. So. Um, that tells me that you will have to find some way, some mechanism, more than what the finance commissions have been doing so far, to provide more resources for equalization. Now comes to the, your point on the political side. I am a strong believer that just administrative devolution is not going to be enough unless you have full political empowerment at the local level as well. That is, people see uh, that their taxes or whatever, their user fees are actually going to elected officials who have political, um, a, how you call it, responsibility towards their electorate. So I do believe we will have to think more on these lines going forward as well. So I think that's the Sorry that's for the long answer. 
So uh, we don't have any more time for more questions. Okay. So thank you, thank you, Dr. Chipper, for so many uh, things that you've thrown at us to think about. So uh, two quick questions. One is a slight pushback, also based on the received wisdom that we're talking about in terms of decentralization. The other one will be a tongue-in-cheek question about if some other received wisdom has led to some of the problems that we have uh, th uh, that you have spoken about. So, in terms of decentralization, I want to. It would be nice to hear what you have to say in terms of two things that we observe. One that while devolution has increased to the states, state bankruptcy has also gone up in India. And typically, what that has been meant in terms of policy prescriptions that we have learned from it is that uh, the farther down local you go, uh, the, the less responsibly, quote unquote, the money tends to be spent. And which is why you tend to get stuck in a problem where one or two states could create moral hazards for the rest of the country. We also find expression for this to a certain extent in what has happened with local governance in China, with huge amounts of local government public debt, which is now showing up as uh, being a problem for the stability of the entire system. Uh, so that would be one. Uh, the second tongue-in-cheek one would be in terms of, you had mentioned that we've never really done any planned urban development. Yeah. And I wonder to what extent it is because of another piece of received wisdom, which was India lives in our villages, which it seems to me has been meant, or at least has been taken to mean that India should continue to live in our villages. And if that has anything to do with it. Yeah. Thanks. No, there are two very good questions, and I don't think I have the time to answer all of them fully, but quickly on the first one. Yes, I mean, um, there, so uh, they call it decentralizing into a vacuum um, or into local uh, structures. Could be either a vacuum or there are very unequal local structures, which then, you know, I can do further. So, so th this is very varied, this experience across India, right? I mean, uh, I'm not an expert on Kerala, but in Kerala, it is the local sarpanch that hires the, the teacher and therefore can monitor absenteeism. And now maybe I don't want to pick on Bihar or somewhere, but you pick, if you picked another state, maybe the sarpanch will hire his daughter-in-law as the teacher and never expect her to show up in class and pay her off anyway. But you know, we have to, we have seen again and again that when you trust people, we consider people to be uh, stupid or illiterate or whatever, but they will vote again and again to, to their interests. And I think we are now, um, we have enough experience in India that, yes, there will be problems of you know, vote rigging, vote buying, or whatever. But overall, I, I'm a much stronger believer to let people have those options to, to then struggle and reform their, their systems locally, um, with some help maybe from outside once in a while. But that's the way we need to go. Um, you talked also about um, the other thing, the uh, question was on the... Ah, no, but yeah, actually, the worse than uh, worse than India, I saw that in Bangladesh. I worked on Bangladesh, and I tried to persuade that then the current prime minister was also prime minister to do something about urban development. But I got the feeling that her vote bank was largely in the rural area, so Bangladesh neglected. Her. So I think the Congress Party probably thought that their workplace was rural areas for a long time, and that the urban areas were mostly with Jansang or with some other party. I don't know what the, I, I'm not knowledgeable enough on the political politics of this, but for, for like 50 years, we neglected urban development. But then we came up with these schemes with Jawaharlal Nehru, urban renewal. This, we split those into three different schemes. Uh, anyway, made a mess of it. It's very top down. 
I'm not sure the current government is doing much better with smart cities and things like that. You know, you have to empower uh, the mayors to s sort out these problems. And you have to sort out broader things like the floor area ratio that I talked about. That explains a lot uh, of, but there now you have political vested interests. You have Puda in Haryana, you have Puda in Punjab, you have uh, DDA now in Delhi, of course, right? And all of them have a huge vested interest in these uh, regulations. Probably in Rajasthan, you have Ruda. Ruda in Rajasthan. I don't know what they call it, but I'm just making a joke out of it. But now you have these. So, so you have to fix some of these at the national level, but I think you have to empower mayors. Yes, there might be uh, bankruptcies, in some cities may, may go and over borrow. Uh, you can try to regulate that. Um, you can, but you know, the broader benefits of that kind of empowerment should not be thrown away because you might end up with a few bad apples here and there. And we have to shift the incentives also uh, that the central money that they will get will not be to bail out, but will be an incentive for better performance. Things can be done. We can talk more later. I just, uh, oh, hello. so I guess my question for you is what is wrong with muddling through? I mean, uh, what's wrong with muddling through? What is wrong with muddling through? Because, uh, you know, you uh, I, I noticed the sort of tension in your, you know, on the one hand, you are receptive to democracy. Uh, so you, so that's, that's important for you that we, India stays yeah. democratic. But then, you know, you draw a lot of these examples uh, from countries like, say, yeah. uh, China, uh, Vietnam, and so on. Now, all of these countries managed to do whatever they did by getting around the problem of democracy, really. I mean, you know, I mean, no, a, 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 I mean that, so Taiwan, Singapore, I mean, all of them grew yeah. when they basically managed to put a, uh, put a lid on mobilization of labor, essentially put a lid on democracy. Then once they achieved a high level of growth, they democratized. Only Taiwan and South Korea democratized. Singapore did not democratize. So authoritarianism is a very important part of the compact that produced whatever growth happened in East Asia. Uh, so I guess my point is perhaps muddling through is a cost that you pay for pursuing development within a framework of uh, uh, democracy and this is how no, I things, I mean, is there any other realistic future for India other than muddling through? No, muddle through is okay, but, you know, you have to, some obvious problems that we are seeing, we have to correct, right? So, for example, our next door neighbor, Bangladesh, which was like half our per capita income, in a period of from 1970, in 50 years, has now reached our per capita income. Same democratic system, same uh, historically colonial administration even. Uh, maybe with some variations, but they have managed, right? So I'm not, I'm, and anyway, we can't change our democratic system. But when you say muddle through, well, it's nice for us to be sitting here quite comfortably, but for the millions without jobs out there, you saw during the pandemic, the millions who were on the roads doing, we can surely do better than that. That even in this uh, democratic setup with all its problems, but I'm a firm believer that th that's, we, democracy is very essential for that happy society that we want to get to. China may become a prosperous nation, but unless its people have more liberty and uh, eventually they might uh, that's the you know part that's supposed to happen it's not going to be a happy country now we already have the democracy why would we give that up now we have to find a way to move forward on, on yeah i guess i can we can discuss this later but the only example that people can give nowadays i feel like when it comes to what's an example of a democracy uh, that is pursuing development, Bangladesh comes up. And I think this has come up no, very true. recently. This has come up because of the fact that the per capita income thing uh, grew. But one can then always, you know, I mean, Bangladesh has had a very different kind of history, high level of non-governmental 
organization's involvement in the growth process and so on. And then, of course, this uh, very fortuitous with the garment industry and so on. So there really is so no comparable. Let me ask, answer that. Yeah. So India, Bangladesh and Pakistan inherited the same labor laws. They were, they, actually, the labor, uh, the, that act, the Industrial Act was passed just before independence. Right. Just before independence. So it was a British uh, inheritance. Pakistan, um, Ayub Khan messed around with it, made it even worse. India did nothing with it. In fact, just kept adding on bells and whistles and wrinkles to it and made it more complicated. Bangladesh, when it got independence, threw it out. Oh, where, whose workers are doing better today, Bangladesh or ours? They have now textile companies that are six, seven times larger than ours. I'm not suggesting we have to go Bangladesh way only, but you know, these things don't happen just by chance. These things happen because certain actions were taken. So that's all I'm saying, that we can see what action. Why should our floor area ratio be so low? And we have sprawl from here to Delhi that you can see a five-story, you know, such expensive land, five-story houses, rickety looking houses all over the place. I mean, we are wasting all this land. Uh, so simple things like that, you know, we can fix. Why should our... Um, it's always be, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't want to, I just want to just, uh, yeah, just one point. Uh, after all of this, you know, uh, people walking on the road, ultimately, the government that allowed that to happen has been uh, re-elected. I'm just saying this is democracy. Simple things don't happen, but sometimes, you know, something very, you, something very strange will happen very quickly. That's all. Yeah, but I was very uh, downcast till I saw the Punjab election. I said, well, a model where health and education and, uh, you know, basics like that were emphasized by a party managed to get elected. Now let's hope they did it. Okay. Yeah, Punjab. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, on behalf of JS, JSDP, uh, Shivangi, who is present online, and I take this opportunity to thank uh, Dr. Chibber uh, for the insightful talk. I think the discussion can go on, but thank you so much. Thank you so much for being here, present in the university, in this forum to address uh, our students and faculty over here. Thank you, uh, Professor Dean, our Dean, uh, Professor Sudarshan, who was instrumental actually in bringing in here, here at very short notice. Uh, so we were able to organize this. Thank you to all the participants who are present here, students, faculty, and all the logistics who have been helping us with the logistics, whether it is communications or with photography, audiovisual, IT. And even those present online and Mani and Lelit, especially over here, who has helped us organize this. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. And, and thank you to our vice chancellor as well, who did make time from his busy schedule and over, who was present over here to present the momento, as well as welcome uh, our Professor Chibboy. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.